Hello. Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Today is lecture number 16. We're going to be talking about uh, Monte Carlo methods, which are uh, really cool because they allow us to solve reinforcement learning problems without a model. So how's the, uh, how's the volume level out there? Someone earlier today was saying that I was a bit low, so just want to know if the volume levels are all right. But before I get started with the lecture, I, uh, I added to the course website here a link to the book. And so if you click on this, you go to the Reinforcement Learning book. And this is the book um, by Sutton and Bartow. So if you, followed the, um, if you followed the link from the syllabus, you get to a PDF version of the book. But I, I just today found the HTML version of the book, and it's quite nice. Um, so the HTML version of the book has a really nice table of contents. And so, for example, if you wanted to study for the exam and you're like, oh, I didn't really understand um, what uh, dynamic programming was, you can click on dynamic programming and you can um, read that section of the textbook. So it's it's really great. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the best textbook that I've ever read. Okay, so I would highly recommend um, reading the textbook or at least the, um, the relevant chapters for, for our class. So again, uh, what did we do with reinforcement learning? Well, we did an intro to reinforcement learning, and so you could read the intro to reinforcement learning here. We did bandit algorithms, dynamic programming, Monte Carlo, and temp temporal difference learning. So if we look here, um, we can see where's banded algorithms. Banded algorithms are there somewhere. So the n-armed bandit problem, right? And so you get a nice explanation of that to supplement my lectures. Uh, then we did dynamic programming. There's a section on dynamic programming. Today we're doing Monte Carlo methods, so there's a whole section on that. And then our next lecture is on temporal difference learning. And the book goes into far more detail than I do, and um, it also gives a lot of background information, and it's, of course, written by the master, uh, or the two masters of reinforcement learning, and, and I was lucky enough to actually take um, Rich Sutton's reinforcement learning class at the University of Alberta. So I, I highly recommend looking at this, and for the exam, just read the relevant chapters. Uh, what else? Um... The assignment is due on Tuesday, so the ge genetic programming assignment, uh, or sorry, the genetic algorithm for Sudoku is due on, on Tuesday, so make sure you get on, uh, that in. And on Tuesday, we'll be talking about temporal difference learning and assignment five, so that's going to be um, a really important lecture. Okay, well, let's pull up the slides here, and we'll get started with this lecture. Okay, so just give me one second here. Try and, okay, there we go. That'll work. All right, so reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo methods. Here I just included a slide which is um, a link to the chapter. I, I think I'll go back and maybe edit the slides so they all have the links to the chapters in them just for uh, ease of use while you're looking over the slides. So what are Monte Carlo methods? Monte Carlo methods are methods for estimating value functions and discovering optimal policies. Unlike dynamic programming, which we talked about last time, uh, we don't assume complete knowledge of the environment and we do not have to have a model of the environment. And what this means, for example, is that let's say, or, or let me go to the next point. So Monte Carlo methods require only experience, a sequence of states, actions, and rewards from an actual or a simulated environment. And so what this means is, for example, if we want reinforcement learning to learn how to play the game of chess, we don't even necessarily need to know the rules of chess. Or if we want um, a reinforcement learning algorithm to, say, learn how to guide a robot around, we don't need to know, like, all the minuscule details of physics in the universe in order to make that happen. So, uh... Actual versus simulated experience. What did I mean when I said that? So, actual experience would be something like a physical robot um, or a human walking around in an actual environment. Uh, learning from actual experience does not require 
a model of the environment when you use Monte Carlo methods. So that's really, really good. Like we don't need to know how to program the universe in order to use Monte Carlo to solve like real world robotics problems. Um, so we don't need to know the dynamics, the physics, the layout, or the full space of the environment in order to solve problems. It's just going to learn from experience. So it's going to take an action, it's going to carry out that action, and get a reward from the environment. And based on that reward, it's going to be able to learn what to do the next time. So, when we talk about simulated experience, we're talking about, like, for example, a video game or a simulation. So some sort of computer simulation, essentially, of an environment. Learning from simulated experience is also very powerful because we don't need to know how the model works. We only need to know the state transition function. So, for example, if we take the game of StarCraft, right? Um, the, so Google had this bot called AlphaStar, which it used reinforcement learning in order to play StarCraft. It didn't need to know all of the source code for StarCraft to learn how to play the game. All it does um, was try out different things and then say, okay, well, I tried making Marines at this point in the game and it didn't work, so don't do that the next time. Or I tried attacking here, maybe I'll try defending next time. And so it just learns from rewards based on what it had done in the past. So Monte Carlo doesn't need to know all the action or straight state probability distributions, whereas dynamic programming actually does. So um, I actually have a nice demo here and I want to open this, so just give me a second for that. Okay, I need to go back here and switch this. So, you can see on the screen here, um, Monte Carlo methods are methods that use sampling in order to solve a problem. So I'll show you a really good example of this right now. So here we have um, a website and that website is going to show us um, how we can estimate the value of pi using Monte Carlo sampling. So you can read this website or go to it if you want. But essentially what happens is, uh, actually let me read what it says here. One method to estimate the value of pi is by using a Monte Carlo method. In the demo above, we have a circle of radius 0.5 enclosed by a 1 by 1 square. The area of the circle is pi r squared, or pi over 4, or, or equals pi over 4, because the radius is 0.5. Um, the area of the square is 1. If we divide the area of the circle by the area of the square, we get pi over 4. So what we're going to end up doing is we know the ratio of the area of the circle to the area of the square. So what Monte Carlo method is going to do is generate random points on the circle. And then since the circle fills up a very specific ratio of the square, we can count the number of random points which fall inside the circle and the number of points which fall outside the circle. So let's see down here. We then generate a large number of uniformly distributed random points and plot them on the graph. These points can be in any position in the square between 0, 0 and 1, 1. If they fall within the circle, they are colored red, otherwise they're colored blue. We keep track of the total number of points and the number of points that are inside the circle. If we divide the number of points within the circle, n inner, by the total number of points, n total, we should get a value that is an approximation of the ratio of the areas that we calculated above, or pi over 4. So in other words, if the number of points inside the circle divided by the number of total points is approximately equivalent to pi over 4, then if we take this ratio, multiply it by 4, we get an approximation of pi. Okay, so let's look up here. So what this is doing is we're going to generate a point. And the points are actually really, really small in this animation, so it's very difficult to see them maybe on the stream. So instead of doing them one by one, I'm going to click Animate, and then you'll see this whole thing filling up with red um, points inside the circle and blue points outside the circle. And if we divide the number of red points by the number of blue points uh, and multiply that by four, we're going to get an approximation of the value of pi. And as you can see, as you put more points here, this is going to get more and more accurate. So ideally, we go toward 3.14155. So right now, we're at 3.124. Um, but 
it'll it'll get more accurate as we produce more points. So this is a Monte Carlo method. And the reason that it's called Monte Carlo is because Monte Carlo was a very famous place for gambling. And so, you know, rolling of dice, random sampling, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's close this now and we can get back to our lecture. Okay, so here, sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble finding the PowerPoint here. Okay, OBS is messing up a little bit. So here on the slide, we can also see that we could use a Monte Carlo method to do something like um, find the value of an integral or the area under a curve. So here, if, if I gave you this function, and that function was just say, you know, f of x equals something, and it produced this sort of squiggly graph, if I wanted to find the area that's shown in dark um, on that graph, what I can do is I can figure out the area of the entire rectangle, and then I can generate a bunch of random points. And if those random points fall under the value, then I can count those. If they fall outside the value, they won't. And so again, I can use that ratio of points that fall under the curve versus points that fall over the curve, and then multiply that ratio by the area of the overall rectangle, and what I've done is now I have an approximation of the integral. And so these are called Monte Carlo methods because they use sampling, they use randomness, etc., and, and that's how they work. So we're going to use this type of method inside, uh, in conjunction with reinforcement learning in order to solve problems that we couldn't have solved use dynamic, using dynamic programming. So Monte Carlo methods are methods that are able to use, are able to solve reinforcement learning problems using samples. And it learns based on averaging the sample returns. So remember we talked about last time returns? So what's going to happen is we're going to try a whole bunch of different stuff. We're going to see what type of returns we get, and returns are the sum of future rewards. And then we're going to average all of those to, to kind of get a feeling for what worked and what didn't work. And that's how we're going to learn. So we will discuss Monte Carlo methods for episodic tasks, not for um, continuing tasks. So for episodic tasks, all experience is divided into finite episodes, and all episodes eventually terminate. The value estimate and policy updates are performed only at the end of an episode, and that's very important. So we're going to play out an entire episode, and then based on what happened in the episode, we're going to go back and check out what didn't work and what did work. So Monte Carlo methods sample and average returns for each state action pair, just like bandit methods do. They compute average rewards for each action and they treat each state as a bandit problem. Each of these bandit problems are related because the return after actions depends on future actions. And because all action selections are learning, the problem is non-stationary to the previous states. Okay, so we'll, we'll show an example of this and this will become um, more obvious. So Monte Carlo prediction, what is this? So we're going to learn state action values for a given policy. So it doesn't make any sense to just say, what's the value of a state? We have to have the value of the state relative to a given policy, meaning what am I going to, or what do I think I should do right now? What is the value of the state based on that? So the value of the state is the expected return. So the sum of discounted rewards starting from the state. So here's an intuitive way that we can obtain the state's value using Monte Carlo methods. So from this current state, we're going to carry out an episode using a given policy. We're going to record all the states that we visited in the episode. We're going to average the return that we got after visiting the state. And then we're going to update the value estimate of the state with the average of all the returns that we've ever seen from this state. And this, can, this is going to converge to the expected value or the true return over time the true expected return over time. And just quickly, uh, a syntax note, because I know this was a little bit confusing last time. When we're talking about a value, that's the expected return from a specific state or a specific situation. So when we say there's, unfortunately, there's two syntaxes for this. So we have V and we have Q. The difference between V and Q is the following. 
V pi of s is the expected future return when starting in a state s and following the policy. So that V is the value of a state. Okay, V is the value of a state. Q of S A, given a policy, is the expected future return when starting in state S, then taking action A, and then following policy pi. So, V is the value of a state, Q is the value of taking an action at a state. Okay, just remember that when it comes to the exam. So Monte Carlo prediction. What is our goal? Our goal is to estimate V pi of S given a set of episodes that we obtained by following a policy pi. Each occurrence of a state S in an episode is called a visit to S, and each state may be visited multiple times in an episode, right? So for example, if we're doing something like pathfinding, maybe our policy is not great yet and it has us visiting the same state multiple times. There's two main types of Monte Carlo um, methods. One is called first visit Monte Carlo and one is called every visit Monte Carlo. And I'm going to show the algorithms for these and I think this will be very, very clear once we get to the algorithm. So first visit Monte Carlo um, is going to estimate V as the average of returns following the first visit of a state in the in the episode. And first visit MC has nicer theoretical properties which we don't need to get into. It's studied more. Please look at this in the book. Every visit MC have different theoretical proper properties and they're usually used for different things like function approximation. But all we really want to know about is the algorithm, right? Like how do we implement this? So here is the every visit MC prediction algorithm, and you'll see sort of how Monte Carlo is going to work for updating our values. So here we have every visit MC, and as part of this, we've got a policy pi. So we're going to set up two variables. The first value variable is V of S. And so V, remember, V is the value of a state. And so in order to calculate these values, we're going to give them initial values um, somehow. So maybe we set them all to zero, maybe we set them all to the minimum or the maximum, but let's just say we're going to set them all to zero now. So we, we set the value of whatever state we're trying to calculate to zero, and then we're going to do something to change that zero to a better value. And returns s, this is an array, and what it's going to store initially is an empty list for each state. And what that's going to store eventually is the list of all the returns that we got after we followed this state um, in, our, in all of our episodes. Okay, so what do we do in the algorithm? The algorithm is actually quite simple. Let me get this up here. So we're going to loop forever um, or until we reach some condition, like however many episodes that we want to do. So first we take our policy and we generate an episode. That episode is, um, we take our policy pi and we generate some episode. Again, an episode consists of, well, we are first at a state, S0, right? Time is equal to zero, we're at some state. We take an action, we get a reward. Then we transition to another state, we take another action, we get another reward. Another state, another action, another reward, up until time t, and t is the final time step. Okay, so we've generated an episode. So for example, uh, let's just say that we were in here and we have uh, some pathfinding thing that we're doing. Okay, so what we can see here is maybe we started up here. So we'll call this like state 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so let's say I'm going to want to walk from zero to six. So my policy, let's say I have like the perfect policy. So my episode is going to be as follows. Well, state zero is zero up here, right? So that's state zero. I'm going to take action down and I'm going to get some reward. Let's just say I get a reward of negative one just because I haven't set up the problem for rewards. Now I'm in state three and I'm going to take the action down and I get a reward of whatever. And now I'm in state six and I get a reward of negative one because I don't need to take an action because I'm in the terminal state. Okay, so 
Here, this is just a, a poorly drawn representation of, of one of these things. It's a list of state action reward, state action reward, state action reward, all the way through the episode. So once we have that episode, now we're going to enter this loop. So for time step t equals zero, all the way up to the final time step. Oh, sorry, ignore this for now. Going backwards, I forgot to change that comment. I'll change that for the, uh, the, uh, the final slides. So what we're going to do is from this time step in this episode, so say we took time step one, for example, so say we're at t equals one, we're going to sum all of the rewards starting at this time step going to the end, okay? So we're going to sum reward one up until reward t. If we started at reward three, we would sum all the rewards from reward three up until reward t. So that's g now. That is the return that we get after time step t in the state, or sorry, in the episode. So now what we do is we append g to returns of st. Okay, so we look up the list in returns associated with this state, and we just append that return to it. Then our value for the state is going to be updated such that it's just the average of all the returns, okay? So for example, if we played a bunch of hands of blackjack and we ended up winning, I don't know, $100, then $200 um, in two consecutive hands, then our value for whatever state we were in would be $150, right? Because the first one, we got $100, the second one, we got 200, so we averaged those, so the value of state of that state would be 150. So this is every visit MC, and there's another algorithm called first visit MC, and the only difference between that one and this one, if you see, there's three lines here. So this line is different, this line is different, and this line is different. And first visit MC is just like it sounds, and all we do is we keep track of all the states visited, and we are only going to update values the first time we see a state. And so here, we're just keeping track of the states that we visited. If the current state in the loop is invisited, then we continue. We no longer update its value, okay? So let's look at an example of this using blackjack. So I just kind of uh, mentioned one, but now we'll do an actual example. So blackjack, if you don't know the rules of blackjack, um, pause this video, go look up the rules to blackjack, and then come back. Um, so it's played in hands. You get dealt cards, you get a reward, and then you're done. And then you play another episode, and those episodes are, for most part, independent. Let's say we have a bet of one units placed every hand, and we had a reward of zero at every state except the terminal state when you either win or you lose. If you win the hand of blackjack, you get a plus one reward. If you lose the hand of blackjack, you get a negative one reward. And if you get a blackjack, you win 1.5 times your money, so you're going to get a 1.5 reward for that. Okay, so your state for blackjack is going to be um, the player, P, and the dealer, D. So we've got two sorts of players in this game. Well, actually, the dealer is part of the environment, but that's okay. So we're going to represent the state as the player, the sum of the player's card, and the dealer's card showing. So if we look here, we have state 14-3, um, and so the first index is the player sum, and the second index is the dealer's card showing. So state 14-3 means that I have a sum of 14, and the dealer is showing three. And we're going to initialize all the values of all states to zero initially. So let's just deal out a, a sample hand here using a policy that is pretty standard in blackjack. And the policy is going to be if we hit, oh sorry, if we have a, uh, a sum less than 17, we're going to hit. If we have a sum of 17 or greater, we're going to stick. Okay, so that's going to be our policy for this game, or for, for these episodes at least. So um, here's our hand of blackjack. This is just one episode. So let's say the player gets dealt a four and a three, and the dealer is showing a seven. So that means state zero 
is going to be I have seven, that's the sum of four and three, and the dealer is showing a four, so the dealer has a four. So if I have less than 17, I'm going to hit. And so since I had a seven, that's less than 17, so my action that I choose from my policy is equal to hitting. And of course, when I hit, I get another card. And let's say that I, um, I got a two, okay? So if I get a two, my sum is nine, and my reward is going to be zero because my reward for taking that action, well, it has led me to a non-terminal state, and so the reward for all non-terminal states is just zero. So now I've gotten the two, so now we're at the state where I have nine and the dealer has four, and this is the next time step, right? This is the next um, state in the episode. So I have nine, which is less than 17, so I'm going to choose the action of hit. So let's say I get a five, and of course this is, no, this is not, a terminal uh, not a terminal state, so my reward is zero. So if I got a five, now my sum is 14. Um, someone just asked what is terminal or non-terminal. So terminal would be when you either stick or you bust, okay? So when you've gotten your last card or when you go over 21. So terminal is when the hand is over in blackjack. So we're not over yet. So if I, uh, if I got a five, I add that to nine. So S2 is going to be 14, four. And so the dealer only gets cards after I've dealt all of my cards. So now I'm going to get a six, um, for example. And my reward is still zero because it's a non-terminal state. So now I've got 20 and uh, the dealer has a four. So action, my action for this one is going to be stand. If I've got 20 in blackjack, I don't want to take another card, okay? So I'm going to stand and my reward for standing immediately is zero, but what happens now is the dealer's policy is fixed and it's going to lead to some terminal state, right? So the dealer policy is actually the same one we just used, but the dealer is going to act as sort of part of the environment because the dealer has no choice whatsoever. The dealer has to follow their set policy. So let's just say, for example, that when I had 20 and the dealer had four, maybe they bust or something. So I'm going to transition now to the state win state. And if I'm in the winning state, I get a reward of one. Okay, so this is an episode, and we can think about episodes in this terms for basically anything, not just blackjack. So the sequence of states was 7, 4, 9, 4, 14, 4, 24, and then win, right? So that was the sequence of states, how I represent them. The reward sequence was 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, if I'm calculating the future return sum, what each index of this array means is the following. Take each index and sum up all the values of itself and everything to the right. So the sum of this zero and everything to the right is one. So I put a one here. The sum of this zero and everything to the right is one. This is a one. The sum of this zero and everything, to, okay. So you get the idea, everything down here is a one. So all of the states eventually got the return of one because we won in this, in this hand. So now what we do for every I in the state sequence length, right? So for each of these states, we're going to go through, find our values. So V sequence I, so somewhere we've got a hash table or a lookup table or something that I can index by these states. And for each of these states, we, are going to say update the average based on the fact that I just got a one, okay? So for example, if um, the average of my state 14.4 up to this point was equal to like, maybe, maybe the first time I visited 14.4, I got a zero. And now the second time in, I visit 14.4, I get a one, right? So my average here is 0 0.5. And what you're going to see over time is for example, like if you've got states like um, 16, uh, 10, or something like that, this is a hand in blackjack where you very often lose. The dealer is gonna win like 80% of the time there. So what should happen is eventually over time when you play enough hands with your policy, you'll see that the value of the state 16, 10 is going to be something like 0 0.8. Oh, sorry, no, like 0 0.2, because the dealer is gonna win 80% of the time. So 
you want to go toward the states that give you higher values. And that's, that's what reinforcement learning is doing. So, so that's how we would do that using Monte Carlo. But could we do blackjack using dynamic programming? That's, that's a question. And the thing is, it would actually be very difficult to compute values for blackjack using dynamic programming. So even though we have a model of blackjack, dynamic programming requires the probability of each action leading to each state. And that's actually kind of hard to compute for blackjack. Like for example, what is the probability that if we have uh, nine as the sum of cards, that we're eventually going to get to us having the sum of 18? Right? That is actually quite a difficult computation and you have to do a lot of simulation and stuff and it's just like really, really hard to figure out. So you're going to have to like pre-compute a whole bunch of values and stuff and it's, it's just not a good way to go about solving blackjack. So another example, if, if we are at state 13.7 and our action is stick, what is the probability that we transition to a terminating state with a reward of plus one? So even though we have the model of blackjack and we know exactly how it works, because it's a randomized game, the probabilities of these transitions are hard to figure out. And they must be known in order to use dynamic programming. But the cool thing about Monte Carlo sampling is that it doesn't need any of these probabilities. All we do is we just play a million games. And after a million games, we're going to figure out what worked and what didn't work. We're going to update our values and then we'll know which states are good and which states are bad. So that was estimating V, which is the state values. But it's not enough to just have the state values because we don't really care about, well, we do care, but more so, we care more about state values. Oh, geez, okay, let me rephrase that, I'm sorry. We we care less about state values than we care about action values. Because in the end, what we want to know is, hey, what action do I take? So, so now that we have those state values, how do we form a policy based on those, right? Because the whole point of reinforcement learning is to come up with a good policy, to make decisions, to take actions that lead us to our goal. So without a model, we can't tell necessarily which actions led us to other states just by using samples and the value update method. So what we have to do, instead of just calculating the value of states, we have to calculate the value of doing an action at a particular state in order to know which action was actually best. So in instead of just calculating v pi of s, what we're going to do is we're going to do the Monte Carlo method, but we're going to update q, q pi of s a. So again, that's the expected return when starting in state s, taking an action a, and following a policy pi. So the reason we want to know this is because let's say I'm in blackjack, and I have I, I currently have 14, and the dealer has a six. I want to know the value of hitting and the value of sticking, right? I don't want to know the value of what if I had 18, because that doesn't really help me. It doesn't help me take my action. I want to know the value of all the different actions that I have available, and then I'm going to take the action which has the highest value. That's how reinforcement learning works. So this is the exact same algorithm as before, but instead of just storing V of S, we now store Q of S A. So before we were just updating returns for every state, but now we're updating returns for every state action pair. So the algorithm is literally the same. I don't need to go into the details of this. Um, it's just that wherever we had V of S before, now we have Q of S A. And this is the every visit version, you know what that means. And this is the first visit, visit version, and now you know what that means. Okay. So we don't need to go into those algorithms because they're the same as the one before, except we're using Q of S A instead of V of S. Okay. So for many problems, the number of states and actions is actually quite large, right? Blackjack is actually a small problem in comparison to say, you know, 
robotics problems or something like that, or pathfinding even. So if we follow a given policy, we will do the same things over and over and not necessarily explore, excuse me. So we must be careful to explore. We have to choose actions at states that have not been done before. Also, we want to explore with states as well. So we're going to sample from states that have not yet been visited. So what this means is that if we start at the beginning of a game that, for example, always has the same starting state, if we're following a given policy and updating values and then updating the policy again with the actions, um, with the highest valued actions, it's very possible that what we're, what we're not doing is exploring parts of the game that our policy would not lead us to. So let's look at a real world example of this. Um, there was an example of a, of a, of a real, uh, sorry, okay. I think what happened in, for example, when D Google DeepMind, they were making the AlphaGo program. And AlphaGo was a reinforcement learning agent that learned to play the board game of Go at a superhuman level. But in the initial phases, what happened was AlphaGo, when it was learning, it learned off of what initially like the first version of AlphaGo. The way it started its training was by looking at human games and learning the value of actions from those human games. And then after it had trained a little bit from the human games, what it did was it used reinforcement learning to play against itself to get better. And so it, it played a number of these games and then it played a game against like an amateur player who made a really big mistake. And the amateur player made a really big mistake that took the board state into a position that because it was so strange and so weird, the learning algorithm had never experienced it before, right? And so because it had never been in that state before, it had no idea what to do in that state and it ended up losing the game. And so what we have to do when we're training something is, is make sure that we're just, we're not just like learning about the parts of the game that our policy would lead us to. We also need to learn the values of, of crazy states like that one in the example. And so what, what this is going to do, this exploration, is it's going to ensure that we visit a lot of different states of the environment and we take lots of different actions. So again, this is the whole exploration versus exploitation. Except here, we really need to visit states that our policy may not guide us to. So, so how can we do that? So Monte Carlo control. So now that we have the values for state action pairs, how are we going to update the policy? So let's remember the last lecture when we did bandit action selection, and this will actually be really easy. So we've seen how to estimate values given that we follow a fixed policy, right? So we just, we just did that. We have a policy, we follow the policy, we generate episodes, and we update the values of state action pairs. But now how do we actually update that policy to perform better over time? Because the real key to reinforcement learning is not just estimating values, but changing your policy so that your policy is better on the next episode. So hopefully by learning the values of QSA over time, we can learn a policy that approximates the optimal policy. And so what this is, this is called policy iteration and is one of the keys to reinforcement learning. So once we have a value estimate, we will update our policy incrementally over time. And this is called generalized policy iteration. So in generalized policy iteration, we, we maintain the estimates of both the following. We maintain our current value function estimates. So either the values of states or the values of state action pairs and our current policy as well. So this is what we currently believe that we should be doing. The value function is repeatedly updated to more closely resemble the true value function. And then the policy is repeatedly improved based on that value. So policy iteration consists of two main processes. And before the, before when the exam was not open book, this was always a question on the final, but now I have to come up with a harder question, right? Cause it's going to be an open book final. 
So policy iteration consists of two main processes. First is policy evaluation. So we make the value function more closely estimate, estimate the value of the current policy. So that is done by taking samples or running episodes. We are evaluating our policy to update our values. Then we do policy iteration. So that's making the policy greedy with respect to the current value function. So what we do is after we've updated the values of our actions at particular states, all we have to do to update our policy is say, well, just like in the bandit action selection, all we have to do is choose the action with the maximum value. So in policy iteration, these two processes alternate and one completes before the other one begins. And GPI refers to the general idea of letting policy evaluation and policy iteration to interact and improve a policy over time. And almost all reinforcement le learning methods resemble GPI, okay? So almost all of reinforcement learning it, um, does this where it evaluates a policy and then it iterates that policy. And here's what that looks like. So over time, two things are occurring. Our values go from our initially like zero estimates to their true estimates. And our policy is going to approach the optimal policy. So um, if we look over here, this is the process of GPI. We've got a current policy over here. We evaluate that policy and in evaluating the policy, we get new samples and we update our values. So the values that we store are going toward the true value of V pi. So the true value of the policy. Then once we have those values, we then update the policy to be greedy with respect to those values. So we run an episode, we get new values, we update the values, then based on those values, we choose the actions which maximize those values and we update our policy. And what happens over time down in this graph is um, here, for example, uh, what we have is the true values and the optimal policy. And let's say our, our current values are, are here somewhere and our current policy is here. We're first going to update the values, then we're going to update the policy, then we're going to update the values, then update the policy, then update the values and the policy, the values, the policy. And as we do this, we get closer and closer and closer to the true values and we get closer and closer and closer to the true pol or to the optimal policy. And so that is the, the entire picture of generalized policy iteration. Okay. So. Now that we know what GPI is, how are we going to actually do that? So how do we apply policy iteration within Monte Carlo methods? So policy evaluation, again, is we're updating the value estimates after an episode has been generated. So that's important. So we generate an entire episode and then we use that algorithm that we showed before, which is the Monte Carlo method value um, update. And that's done after the episode has been generated. And after we've updated our values, then we update the policy based on the new value estimates. Okay. So I'm, I'm repeating myself from the last slide, but here we're going to have some initial policy. We do evaluation. We get um, values based values of that policy. Then we do iteration to get a new policy evaluation, new values, iteration, new policy, evaluation, new values, iteration, new policy. And at each time step, when we update our uh, policy, that's just going to be taking, uh, here we say arg max of A for QSA. And what that means is that when we update our policy, we're going to set pi of S, which is the action that we should do at, at a state S, equal to the action which maximizes the value of QSA. So we're going to iterate over all of the actions at a given state and choose the one that has the maximum value. So here that is in sort of a pseudocode form. So this is going to be a Monte Carlo policy iteration. So we're going to start off with QSA, some initial value estimates. Maybe we set them all to zero. Maybe we set them all randomly. Doesn't really matter. We're going to have a policy P and our policy is going to store for each state it's going to store the probability that
that we should take each of the actions. So um, usually what we do is we say um, our, our policy initially is just equiprobable. And what that means is the following. So up here, let's say that I have uh, four moves that I can do. Maybe we're doing pathfinding. So if I have up, down, left, and right, if those are the actions that I can do from a given state, then I'm going to set the probability of doing each of those to 1 over 4. So it means that whenever I go to select an action, I'm doing, I'm doing them at random, essentially. So that is our initial policy, is that we make all of our actions equiprobable. And the reason for that is that we don't know which action is best yet. And so we want to use that action, or we want to like choose a random action and, and see how it goes. All right, now we enter the generalized policy iteration loop. So this is the GPI loop right here. So we generate an episode and we store it in this variable E. So the episode again is going to have states, actions, reward, state, action, reward, state, action, reward for each time step. Then we're going to update the value estimates based on the returns in the episode and store that in Q like we did before. And then we're going to update the policy to choose the actions with the maximum values in Q. And that's our new policy. And we just do that however long we have, right? So maybe we have an hour, so we do a bunch of these things. Maybe the robot is only allowed to, to be in the parking lot for 10 minutes, and so we do that for 10 minutes. And after that, Q is going to estimate the true values, and P is going to estimate the optimal policy. All right, so that's that's generalized policy iteration. That's like the, the main idea behind reinforcement learning is testing our current policy, updating our values, and then updating our policy and doing that in an iterative way. So we talked about exploring. So there's one thing that we can do to ensure good exploration in Monte Carlo. So many problems have large state and action spaces, and in practice, practice, many state action pairs will never actually be visited. And so when we generate episodes, it's important to vary the starting states, if possible, to ensure that all the states get sampled. And this process is called exploring starts. So Monte Carlo ES is Monte Carlo with exploring starts. In MCES, all the returns for state action pairs are similarly accumulated and averaged. MCES cannot converge to any suboptimal policy. I, can't, I cannot stress um, how important that is. It means that if we run Monte Carlo ES for long enough, it will converge to an optimal policy. So it will learn the best thing to do. If it did, so let's just say, for example, it could converge to a non-optimal policy. Then the value function would converge to the value for that policy, and the policy would change. And so convergence to the optimal policy is inevitable in, in Monte Carlo ES, as changes in the action value function decrease over time. So this is like, it's really interesting, because if you were doing the suboptimal thing, in your policy, then your values would be really low, so your policy would change. And if your policy is doing really good things, your values update, and now you're more sure about the, the good things. And so Monte Carlo ES is like intuitively converging to the best possible solution, but at the time of me writing those slides, it had not been proven. I don't know if there's been any breakthroughs in the last year or so. So in practice, Monte Carlo with, with exploring starts converges slowly because not a lot of different states are visited. So what we could do is instead of using Monte... Oh, let me give you an example of this. Um, so Monte Carlo with exploring, in exploring starts, let's say we had uh, a robot and we had a robot out in a parking lot and we had like, I don't know, a food pellet on the ground somewhere that the robot had to find. So if I was just doing Monte Carlo in episodes, I would take the robot to like the same corner of the parking lot every time I started an episode. So the robot would wander around until it found the pellet. And then maybe I'd move the pellet and then I'd put the robot back in the same starting position and have it find the pellet. But if it's doing that and it's getting good at it, then there are parts of the environment that it's never visiting, 
right? Maybe over in the other corner somewhere on the other side of the food pellet. So what Monte Carlo Exploring Starts would do in that situation is it would mean that every time we started a new episode, we would instead of putting the robot in like the same corner, we would take it and we would put it um, like in a random place in the parking lot. So that's what it means. It's, it's exploring the different starting states for different episodes. If we didn't want to do that, let's say we physically couldn't pick up the robot and put it in a random place, then what we could do um, is we could also implement Epsilon Greedy, right? So in order to visit new states, instead of putting us in a random state at the start, what we could do is take more random actions. And so all of this Monte Carlo stuff, you don't have to just take the maximizing action. Remember, that would be greedy selection. We could use Epsilon Greedy, or we could use the UCB algorithm that we talked about back in the Bandit Problems uh, lecture. By including randomized actions, more states get visited, more actions get sampled, and we learn quicker. Okay? So that's, that's what we want to do. That's the whole idea of Monte Carlo, is we're going to take um, our agent, we're going to run it for a whole bunch of samples, we're going to see what it did, um, and after an episode... Sorry, we're going to see how the episode turned out, whether it was good or bad. If, if the episode ended well, then all the actions in that episode are going to be updated to say, hey, you did well. If, if the episode ended poorly, we'll update all the actions to say, sorry, but you actually did poorly. And over time, the good episodes, or sorry, the good actions at the good states will produce better um, episodes, and so their values will converge to to uh to the true values which are better and those actions with higher values are going to um update our policy to select those actions more often okay so that's it for that part of the lecture but what i want you to do is go watch this youtube video okay um let me see if i can exit out of here and paste this in the chat for you give me a second What's going on here? Ah. Okay, here we go. Let me paste that in the chat. Here is the YouTube video. I want all the students to go watch this video because it's amazing. It's about 15 minutes long, so I don't want to play a 15 minute video. Um, on the, on the stream because, you know, I don't want to take revenue from them, etc. But that's a video from Stand Up Maths. It's an amazing, amazing um, YouTube channel. And what they do is they teach match, they, they, they do machine learning on tic-tac-toe using matchboxes. And it's absolutely incredible. It's not exactly the same thing as Monte Carlo uh, policy iteration, but it does use Monte Carlo to directly learn a policy, okay? So in that video, um, they're not learning values, they're learning the policy directly. And there will be a question on the exam about that video, okay? So you've got 15 minutes left in this lecture, technically, so please watch that video now, but I'm, I'm going to end the stream. Right? It's, it's really incredible. So, um, yeah, go watch that video. It says the video content can be on the exam. I, you can pretty much say that it will be on the exam. I'm going to have a question about that. And the question won't be like, what did he say at minute six minutes and 30 seconds? It's going to be a conceptual question that was not answered directly in the video. So you're going to have to understand what was going on in that video in order to answer the question on the exam. All right, so uh, just to reiterate, um, assignment five is due on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we will be going over temperance differ temporal difference learning and Q learning, which is like, you know, the first great algorithm to come out of reinforcement learning and probably the most famous reinforcement learning algorithm. And we'll go over assignment five as well, and assignment five will be using Q learning. So that's it for this lecture, and I will see you on Tuesday.